Bienvenue à la deuxième session aujourd'hui. Um, the, uh, welcome to the second session, um, the first session of the afternoon. Um, it is, I'm, my name is, is um, Clint Kelly. I'm a behavioral ecologist in the Department of Biology here at Japan. Um, I will be moderating today's session, and it's my pleasure today to introduce John Sicada. John is a neuropathologist in the Department of Biology at McGill University. Could you use the, uh, the Is this on? Okay. John is a neuroethologist at the University of um, at McGill University. Um, John did his PhD at University of Texas at Austin, and he graduated in 2002. From there, he went on to do a postdoc at UC San Francisco. And seven years ago, he began his faculty position at McGill. So today, John will be talking to us about animal, um, the effects of audiences on um, animal behavior. I should also add that John will accept questions during the talk, not necessarily after. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, um, thank you, Clint, for the introduction. And I wanna thank Stephen uh, for inviting me here to give a talk here. This is my first time participating in the summer school. Seems like you guys got a lot of really cool stuff coming in the next coming uh, week and a half. Um, so enjoy. All right, so today uh, I'm gonna talk to you about audience effects on communication. Uh, I'll focus, I'll have a, give a broad introduction, but I'm gonna focus primarily on my work in songbirds. Now I think audience, effect, audience effects on behavior in general is a really important thing to study, just to study, to, to understand behavior as a whole. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting and it's particularly germane for today in this kind of summer schools because all the examples of these talks that we're giving to you guys are in fact uh, manifestations of audience effects. Before we even gave our, before this week, Stephen sent out an email that described the composition of the audience. He said there are gonna be undergraduate and graduate trainees here as well as, as, well as uh, principal investigators. So please tailor your talk to this audience. And so therefore people like myself and all the other speakers really thought about how best to describe our work and how best to present our research to make it digestible and understandable for this type of audience. And needless to say, the, how I would describe my work would be very different if I was describing it to non-scientists or even children for that matter. Um, and so just as it seems a little bit meta to think about this as sort of an audience effect talk um, is really a manifestation of an audience effect. Also, I have a tendency to talk really fast. So if I, I'm gonna ask Alex to like raise his hand if I'm talking too fast. So I'll slow down. Okay, um, and I'll speed up. So, oh, this doesn't go fast. So, um, in general, my lab studies social influences on the performance of communication signals. And generally speaking, I, my work, my laboratory studies these, the biological mechanisms underlying these uh, social influences on behavior, in particular communication. So today I'm gonna step a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the implications for for social influences on communication, uh, in, 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 in particular how these social influences might lead insight into uh, cognitive processes in animals. Okay, so here's the general introduction, uh, the outline for the talk. I'm gonna start with the general introduction to audience effects, and then I'm gonna talk about audience effects on the performance of birdsong, so research out of my laboratory. And then I wanna talk a little bit more broadly about how do you interpret these audience effects on behavior. And again, feel free to uh, raise your hand, interject with any questions if something's not clear. Okay, uh, general effects, uh, general introduction. So the question is what are audience effects and why should we study them? Right. That's a totally valid question. Um, and there are a couple, I think, very interesting reviews that one could read if you're interested in audience effects. Uh, there's one by Klaus uh, zuber Bueller in about 10 years ago in Current Biology, where he sort of lays out, the, uh, gives you the lay of the land for the, the field of audience effects on behavior as it stood 10 years ago. And more recently, there's a, a commentary or a review in animal behavior uh, by Koppinger et al, where this is sort of an, a, 
different perspective. They're coming from a human research perspective and saying how research in animals could benefit from really thinking about looking into what kind of work on, uh, has been done in, in humans with regard to audience effects and communication. And I, I'm going to borrow a little bit from both of these in my general introduction. So broadly speaking, in the field of animal communication, audience effects refer to the change in signaling behavior caused by the presence of individuals. And you see actually audience effects in a wide range of animals, ranging from invertebrates to vertebrates. Um, and generally speaking, this demonstrates some sort of flexibility in signaling. But this definition is, is very broad, so I want to break it down a little bit. Um, so first of all, this audience effects refer to the change in signaling behavior. Now, that can take many uh, different forms. A couple of them that are, are frequently studied are changes in the likelihood or the rate of signaling. And actually, this is something that's most often studied in animal communication studies, is to see how the presence of individuals can change the rate or frequency uh, at which a particular signal is produced. Um, and in contrast, when you look at the human literature, uh, audience effects on communication, in particular speech and language, uh, mostly manifest themselves as sort of changes in the acoustic structures of vocal signals. And that's, that's, and I think what the review, this Coppinger review is trying to do is trying to sort of impress upon these, uh, in a, our ethologist to think a little bit more about analyzing the acoustic structures of these, of these uh, vocalizations in response to variations in audiences. Okay. okay, so that's one thing that's important to understand with regard to the definition of audience effects. And then second is, you know, this, this, according to this definition, an audience effect is something that, a uh, change in behavior that's uh, caused by the presence of individuals. Now that in and itself is very, very, very broad. Like we can think of it as the presence or absence of other individuals, right? Or it can be a little bit more specific. Is it the particular, uh, uh, the identity of the individuals that you're surrounded by? So is, are there kin that are you're, you're next to or, or you're with? Um, do you, does this involve some sort of individual recognition? Are, are there differential, differential signals produced to familiar versus unfamiliar individuals? And are there different signals produced to when you're surrounded by dominant or subordinate individuals? Right? So these are all important aspects to think about with regard to audience effects. And again, in general, why I think they're important is that they demonstrate the flexibility as well as the complexity of signaling behavior. Any questions? Could I define what a signal is? Okay, so that is, right now I'm gonna be a bit broad and agnostic. Um, so you can have latent, or sort of these static signals, for example, coloration on an individual, that can serve as a signal, but that's not the signal that I, I'm gonna be talking. I'm talking mostly about these overt behaviors that individuals engage in, in nominally to convey information to the, this receiver, right? That's a good question. Anybody else? Okay, moving on. Um, so in these uh, couple reviews, they, they talk a little bit about why we should study audience effects. And they're important for a number of different reasons. And first, they can provide insight into the function of particular communication signals. Right? So as ethologists, all we know is, all we have is what we can see. Right? We see a behavior. We don't really know what the function of that behavior is. But if a particular communication behavior is only exhibited under when certain individuals are present, then they can provide some insight into the potential functional significance of those signals. Uh, and audience effects can also influence uh, the perception and interpretation of signals, in particular, if there are changes to the acoustic structure of vocalizations that could affect how receivers of the audience members can perceive those vocalizations. But I think more germane to the topic of this, this, uh, the summer school is that audience effects could suggest some volitional control over signal production. Right? And they could also suggest that signalers are aware of receivers' perceptual states and are able to adjust, adjust their signals accordingly. Right? So let me back up a little bit. In the broad field of communication, we generally frame these questions of, you have a signaler producing a signal that goes to the environment and it's perceived by the receiver and that changes the behavior of the receiver in some way, potentially to, to benefit the signaler. Right? So that's broadly how we speak about communication. And so here, when I talk about the, the signaler, I'm talking about the individual that's producing this, in this case, like for example, with birds, vocalizations, and the receivers are sort of the audience or the intended, if you will, uh, conspecific that the signal is targeted toward. 
Okay, so given that framework, I think what is important before we go into the details of some of my studies, it should give you some, some I think, what are interesting examples and historic examples of, of audience effects on signaling behavior. All right, so one of the earliest studies on uh, audience effects was a study, a, like a seminal study done by Peter Marler in the, in the mid uh, 80s, is to look at food calling in domestic chickens. And what these chickens will do is they'll produce these calls in response to seeing food. And it's not just a reflexive action. This is something that, that Peter Marler's studies showed. They actually pro only produce these food calls under certain social situations. They won't produce these food calls. Again, they, they produce them when they see food, but they, they won't produce them when they're by themselves or when they're with another, when they're another, with another male. But they will produce these food calls when there's a female there. Now, it doesn't matter if the female is familiar or unfamiliar. It just matters that there's a female there. And so if there's a female there and he sees food, he'll produce a food call. So there's some sort of uh, complexity to this sort of call, res uh, call response or call behavior. You also have food calls in chimpanzees. This is a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, what happened in, these, in this study is that they found that male chimpanzees are more likely to put, uh, produce these food calls when, they're in the when they discover food in the company of important social partners. Okay. Now, important social partners is, is really hard to define, and they defined it as individuals that they groomed quite often, right, the top three individuals. So there's some sort of complexity to this. It's not just this reflexive response to seeing food. There's some sort of social audience or so effective conspecifics on that calling behavior. Now we have a number of different examples of audience effects on, on signaling when we, th when we look at alarm calling. So we have a lot of different animals produce alarm calls in response to predators. And these, uh, the studies of vervet monkeys in East Africa, uh, spearheaded by uh, Dorothy Cheney and Robert Seafarth, have really been seminal in, in, our, in helping us understand the function of animal communication signals. And one of the things that these are really important for is understanding the degree to which these signals are referential. But independent of that, a number of other studies since then have demonstrated that there's a lot of complexity or flexibility in the production of all these alarm calls to predators. So just a little bit of background. So these vervet monkeys, they live in these troops of highly related individuals and matrilineal troops. And they have these, uh, whenever they see these predators, they produce a particular type of alarm call. And they have distinct alarm calls for distinct predators. So when they see an eagle, they produce an eagle alarm call, and that eagle alarm call is acoustically distinct from a leopard alarm call, and that leopard alarm call is produced when that individual sees a leopard, and that leopard alarm call is acoustically distinct from a snake alarm call. Right? And also the behaviors that are evoked when individuals uh, hear these alarm calls are quite different. When an individual hears an eagle alarm call, they run into this bush, when an individual hears a leopard alarm call, they run up into the tree. And when an individual hears a snake alarm call, they get up on their hind limbs and they look for the, the snake to mob. Right? And so there's very different signals that are being produced in response to different predators. And there are very, very different behaviors that are elicited from hearing or perceiving that signal. But then interesting, well, the, the germane thing for this talk is that they don't always produce these alarm calls. In fact, they they produce these alarm calls more when they're in the presence of others. Right? They don't produce these alarm calls when they're by themselves. And that kind of makes sense because if there's a predator around and you give a really loud conspicuous call, you're just making yourself more conspicuous. Right? And so this idea, there's, there's been a lot of studies thinking about the function of these alarm calls, and part of it in kin, or kin selection is certainly one part of it. But uh, I think just for this talk, we'll just be a bit more uh, agnostic about this, and we'll just say that there's a complexity to it that there's a social gating, and these individuals, these adults, will produce more of these alarm calls when they're in the presence of others. But I think this even, what's even cooler than that is that there's, it's more complex than that. These adults will provide more alarm calls in the presence of their own offspring, as opposed to the, the presence of other individuals' offspring. Right? So there's a little bit of kin recognition going on, and when they perceive their kin to be in the immediate environment, they're more likely to produce these alarm calls. Uh, questions so far? Yeah. Are these, observed in the zoo environment? these are observed in the wild. Yeah. Do we see these in the zoo? I don't know if people have done the, a lot of these studies in the zoo. I think you can evoke these sort of alarm calls when you, pre, uh, when you present model predators to them. Uh, I don't know about the vervets per se, but they've done they've done this with other primates. Yeah. Like I think they've done their chimpanzees. I don't, it's not, the, the production of the, the alarm call is not learned. There's a little bit of a, um, 
developmental, there could be this learning process. So when they actually had some studies in the, uh, about 30 years ago now, where they looked at the accuracy of alarm call production. And if you look at these infants, let's say an eagle alarm call, for example, while when these infants produce these calls, they generally produce these calls in response to aerial things in the air, and they won't produce these eagle alarm calls to uh, ter terrestrial things. But the range of large birds that they produce these alarm calls to is quite broad, and with time it gets winnowed down to just the martial eagles, their main predators. Right? So it's not clear if there is learning, or if that's just some sort of natural developmental process, or if there's act active instruction going on of when they should be these young should be producing these type of alarm calls, but there does seem to be some develop developmental change in the usage of these calls. Yep. Yes. Is it always the same? The question is: Is it always the same individual that gives the alarm call? Uh, I think there's quite a bit of variability in who. It's whoever detects it first. Um, but uh, I don't know if there's a hierarchy in terms of their particular individuals that are more likely to call than others. Does anyone know? Okay. Yes, question. Yeah, the question is, do they, do they learn the, the interpretation of the... I think in general, from my understanding, is that it's pretty innate that they know what to do from the first time they hear it. Um, but there is some learning on how they use it. So there's different types of learning. There's like comprehensive, uh, comprehension usage uh, learning, there's usage learning, and there's production learning. And I think for usage learning, there's a little bit of evidence for that. For uh, comprehension learning, I think it seems from the get-go they, they know what to do. But I don't think there have been a lot of controlled studies of that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on just for the sake of time. Uh, so just a couple uh, other examples of audience effects. So when you look at Belding's ground squirrels, they also produce these alarm calls. This is just a spectrogram. It's a fairly simple call. This is frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. This is about two seconds of time. They produce these short, high-frequency sounds, and they produce them in succession, and they produce these in, uh, these in response to detecting a predator. And these Belding's ground squirrels are more likely to produce these alarm calls when they're kin around. Right? So this suggests that there's some benefit to, to the kin in producing these alarm calls. Um, within great tits, you see that these also produce these predator alarm calls, although these males are more likely to produce these alarm calls when uh, their mate is around or other familiar females are around. Right? So there's this modulation, this gating of this production based on the composition of the audience around them. And I think there's more, there's a, it gets more complex than that. There's some um, studies on Thomas Langer's that they live in these troops where they have a lot of individuals. And what happens is when they give, they're, they're more likely to produce an alarm call when there are other individuals around. That's, that's fairly common observation in a lot of study, in other species that produce alarm calls. But what's interesting about these guys is that everybody in their troop will eventually produce an alarm call in response to a predator. And what happens is that the, the, the individual monkey that first signals the detection of that predator will keep signaling about that predator until he or, her, he or she hears everybody in the group produce a vocalization. Right? So the, the interpretation of this is that there is potentially some understanding by this first signaler about the awareness states of other animals and that when these other animals produce this call, that suggests that they've attended to either, they've either detected the predator or perceived the fact that this initial signaler produced an alarm call. Right? But regardless, this is sort of, it, it, it also involves some process where they have to keep track of which individuals have already given an alarm call. And that in and of itself is, is not an easy task. Okay, last animal example um, chimpanzees. They have a really, there have been a number of studies thinking about the flexibility of, of alarm calling um, and with regard to more cognitive aspects of them. And there have been some neat studies out of um, Klaus Zuberbuehler's lab. And one study suggests, a couple studies suggest that these individuals will produce more alarm calls when they're surrounded by individuals who are not aware of the threat. Right? So they've done this in a couple different ways, but the, both of these studies seem to come to the same conclusion that if the signaler 
is surrounded by an individual who does not know about this, they use a model snake here, this viper. And if they're surrounded by individuals who are unaware of that snake, they'll continue to produce this, this alarm call. And in contrast, if they're surrounded by individuals who are already cognizant, quote unquote cognizant of that viper, uh, viper then they won't produce as many of these alarm calls. So their interpretation of these, these data are, uh, can be quite variable, but one of the su suggestions is that this is some possible indication of theory of mind, of mind reading, um, but we can discuss it at, at the end. All right, I lied, there's more, one more example of audience effects. Uh, so we're gonna go to a model system called humans, um, and what we, what we what people have studied a lot in humans is thinking about how people change their vocalizations in response to different audiences. And an audience that people have studied extensively are infants. Right? So universally, across all these different cultures, across languages, people speak differently to children, right? to infants in particular. And infant-directed speech is different from adult-directed um, adult speech in a, a variety of different ways. So relative to adult-directed speech, infant-directed speech, also known as parentese, is characterized by longer pauses between vocalizations, uh, higher fundamental frequencies, or higher pitch, more exaggerated pitch contours, so there's you, those kind of things, there's more repetition of words, and there's more distinctive speech sounds. Right? So the, this idea of distinct, distinctive speech sounds might be a little bit uh, vague, so I want to show you some example, or one example of what this means. Um, so people have talked about this phenomenon of hyperarticulation, and what you can do is you can map out the sound of vowels in two-dimensional space. And what you can do is a vowel, you can measure these things acoustically of particular vowels. For example, uh, this is up here, can you see this? This is, up here is the sound E, like in sheep, and then this is U, like in shoe, and this is A as in shark. Uh, and what you can do is, for each of those vowels, you can measure these formants. This is the first formant, and this is the second formant. This is where a lot of the power and the acoustic, their acoustic power is. And you can map the first formant and the second formant of each of these different vowel types. When you look at adult-directed speech, which is the dashed lines, and you look at the centroids, I think the adult-directed speech are the, the, the uh, empty circles here, and these squares indicate the centroids for each of these groups. Regardless, if you just look at the triangle, uh, for adult-directed speech, the triangle that connects these sort of the canonical vowels uh, for adult-directed speech is relatively small compared to the space of these vowels when these indiv same individuals are speaking to infants. Okay. So if you just look at the size of the triangle, the size of the triangle is representative of, of acoustic space. And the idea is that the, the, when you're talking, individuals are talking to infants, they expand this vocal space to increase the space between these vowels, right? this acoustic space. And therefore, these sounds of the, this i, i, u, and a are more separable. They're more, uh, they can perceive them as more different. So that phenomenon is called hyperarticulation. And you see this across many, many different languages. So here's the hyperarticulation in English speaking individuals, and here's hyperarticulation in Russian speaking individuals. Uh, this again, this is the, the smaller triangle is the adult directed speech, the larger triangle is uh, infant directed speech. Right? So there's an expansion of vowel space. And people think that these vocal modulations are, will promote the linguistic and social cognitive development of infants and also stimulate social interactions. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more about this hyperarticulation. Okay, that's just the first part. Uh, any questions about general introductions about audience effects? Okay, great. So I'm gonna talk about three studies from my lab that address just two main questions. Um, the first deals with the effects of familiarity of audience members on the motivation and performance of courtship song. There's a couple studies, uh, one study in Bengalese finches and one study in zebra finches. Uh, and the second study will be looking at the effects of audience composition on metrics of song performance. Okay. So for the first study, again, we're, we're focusing on this idea of the effects of familiarity. Uh, we're tapping into this idea of individual recognition and how does that individual recognition mediate uh, or modulate the acoustic structure of, of vocalizations. 
All right, so this first study is in Bengalese finches, and we're looking primarily at this uh, female-directed courtship song. Now, a lot of these astralded uh, song, uh, finches produce song primarily for courtship, so they'll sing songs when they're by themselves, but they'll also sing songs when there's a female there, they'll, they'll have this big, nice courtship dance, and they'll direct this, this song to, toward females. So, like we said, we want to look at the effects of familiarity or individual recognition on song production and, and performance. So we had this design where we have this individual Bengalese finch, uh, male Bengalese finch, in a sound, uh, acoustic chamber. And what we do is we present a female that's in a different cage next to his cage for about 30 seconds. And then we remove her, wait for about four or five more minutes, and then put her in again, evoke some courtship song, remove her after 30 seconds, wait four to five minutes, and then put her in again. Right? So there's three uh, exposures to the same female with a four to five minute interval between exposures and with just 30 seconds of exposure to the female. Uh, and what happens is during this process of continuous exposure to the same female, what we think is that the individual females become familiar to that experimental male. Right? And we can see how song changes on the first versus second versus third exposure to that female. We do that for one female, and we do that for I keep using this. Uh, many different females, uh, and for this one male during this experimental session. Okay, so for the first plot, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the proportion of males producing courtship songs. So we, we use this experimental paradigm uh, to study the effects of familiarity in 16 male Bengalese finches. And what we're doing is we're plotting the proportion of males that produce courtship song on this first exposure to a female, second, and third. And I should mention that the females that we use varied from male to male. It's just, I'm just using these symbols to represent this individual female, but the, it, we randomized the order of female presentations here. And all these females were not familiar to the males to begin with. Okay, what you see is over, uh, across these three exposures that the proportion of males producing courtship song uh, dramatically goes down from the first to the second to the third exposure here. Where's my button? Here. Um, and just to help you see that, it's pretty obvious here, but there, I'm going to draw these arrows. And so it looks like maybe there are some evidence of, of individual recognition or, or, or habituation. And then what you can do is you can switch it up and you give them a different female now. And when you look at the proportion of males uh, producing courtship song, when you switch the female, that goes up, and that's sort of a classic habituation, dishabituation paradigm. And then you expose that female three times, you get that, this decrease in courtship production. Uh, and then this goes on for, for six different females. You have three exposures per female, and what you consecutively see is that when you expose that male to the same female on consecutive occasions, you get a decrease in the likelihood of courtship, and then when you switch the female, you get this increase in the proportion of males showing that. So this is pretty classic uh, habituation, dishabituation, and it really it suggests that there's some effects of individual recognition on the performance of courtship song. And I should note, this is, uh, this is just another depiction of this. This is just looking now within um, each male. So you can collapse across all these six females and say what proportion of tests uh, on the first exposures did the male court the female or produce courtship song for, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The short story is that this is another depiction of this, this effect of familiarity on uh, courtship song production or the probability of producing courtship song. So in the end, uh, I think the conclusion from this part of the analysis is that uh, the familiarity of the audience affects the likelihood of producing courtship song. And another way to say that is that familiarity affects the motivation to produce courtship song. Yes? So you can interpret this as frustration, or you can interpret this as fatigue, right? So those are two things. And we, in our experiment, we have, that's a good question, we have other controls that we did to control for fatigue or even frustration. What we did was on every exposure, we gave them a different female, right? So there's no, there's no consecutive exposure. They're all unfamiliar females in each presentation. You do get a small decrease in either because of frustration or because of fatigue, but it's nowhere near as steep as a decline when you present the same female on consecutive occasions. Yes. 
Yeah, so that's a good. Uh, let me talk about that later. The question was, what does the, basically, what is the behavior of the female? Like, does the behavior of the female change on each of these exposures? And um, generally speaking, they don't behave all that much. The, the, we select the stimulus females to be very still. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's something that we haven't picked up, right? But it's a good question. We'll talk about this then. Yep. Sorry, could you say that again? Do male, so are you saying that males that do not produce courtship song to females? Oh, do. Are there more sexually vigorous males than alpha males in the colony, in the social situation? Yeah, so we haven't done a map of that. We know that there are some subtle hierarchies that you see in these group cages, but as to whether they correlate with their propensity to display courtship behavior is as unclear. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we found that, but I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't find that. Okay, okay, so moving on. Um, so we wanted to complement this sort of measures, uh, these analyses of motivation to sing with measures of, I'm not, I'm not learning this well, of song performance, right? And so we wanted to look at the effects of familiarity on performance metrics of courtship song. Now, one question is, what are performance metrics, right? So we have been doing a lot of research on thinking about the, this acoustic structure of songs. And if you want to go beyond just looking at the acoustic structure, you could instill some sort of value to particular aspects of songs. So for example, tempo, stereotypy, and duration. These are metrics that people have argued are, are performance metrics. So in particular, faster songs are better. Faster songs are harder to produce. And if you can produce a really, really fast song, if you speak really fast, then you're better at singing. Uh, if you can produce a stereotype song, that's generally better. I'll flesh this out a little bit more. And if you're a more fit male, you can potentially sing for longer periods of time. So song duration seems to be a, a metric of performance. So these are these things, three uh, sort of performance metrics that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but let me, let me back up a little bit in terms of uh, thinking about the experimental design and how do we actually measure changes in performance. So like, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a male in a sound attenuating chamber, and then we introduce a female to his, uh, to his chamber for about 30 seconds and we move her thereafter. And we do this iteratively, and in the interval in which he's not next to a female, he can produce a song, and we call these non-courtship songs. So this is a, a design that we've, I've been using for uh, about a decade now. Um, we've been sort of collecting these interleave renditions of non-courtship song and courtship song. So you have a male Bengalese finch by himself, he produces a non-courtship song. We put in the female next to him, he produces a courtship song, you take her out, he has a non-courtship song, you put her back in, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to collect these interleave renditions of courtship and non-courtship songs. So they're produced at the same time of day, uh, and these courtship songs are really rapidly produced, they're generally produced within a, a, a second or two of putting in the female. And so we're looking at these sort of rapid changes to song, um, controlling for things like time of day. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze, we're recording song throughout the whole time, and we're gonna analyze changes in song tempo, uh, acoustic stereotypy, and in song duration. And we're gonna compare courtship song relative to non-courtship song. Okay, so song tempo and song duration I think are relatively straightforward, right? Song tempo is a speed, which are the things, uh, we generally measure the duration of a sequence, and so shorter sequences are faster songs, so we're looking for a decrease in sequence uh, duration. And song duration is really how long they sing for. Like, like longer songs have more uh, higher values. But stereotypy is a bit more ambiguous. Okay. And so we've been, we've been looking at acoustic stereotypy for a number of years. And, and one of the arguments for thinking about stereotypy as a, as a measure of performance goes like this. Okay, so we can think about song production in birds as like any other motor skill. And it's a pretty boring way to think about it, but it, it, it's, it certainly man has a lot of properties that are just like throwing a ball, like learning how to throw a ball or learning how to catch a ball or play, like uh, hit a tennis ball. So songbirds are really neat because they're one of the few animals that learn their vocalizations during development. Just, and the process of vocal learning in songbirds is highly analogous to the process of vocal learning in humans. And actually that's a, that's a big part of what we do in the lab. 
the, the main point is that as juvenile uh, finches learn their song, when they first start uh, pr practicing the song, they're really, really variable. They don't have good control over their vocalizations, and if they try to produce a particular sound, they're, they're sort of all over the place. But as they grow older and older and they practice their song more and more, they become more stereotyped and they can hit that note much more accurately. Okay? And so we think that stereotypy is a manifestation of how, of how your motor control, your ability to control your vocal muscles, and as an ability of your expertise in producing that particular sound. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the, we're not going to measure, we're going to measure the inverse of, of stereotypy. We're going to look at variability, and in particular, the coefficient of variability of a thing called fundamental frequency, which is uh, one of the, the lowest form in the analysis. Okay, so what we'll, we're going to do is we're going to take some Bengalese finch syllables. This is, these are two Bengalese finch syllables. This is frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And then we're going to take a syllable like this, and it's a syllable with flat harmonic structure, and we're going to measure the fundamental frequency, and that's this band here. Right? And what we're going to do is on every time this bird produces that syllable, we're going to measure the fundamental frequency of that syllable, and then we're going to plot the distribution of those, that syllable when the bird sings non-courtship song or courtship song. Okay, so if you look at the distribution of the fundamental frequencies for this individual syllable across many, many renditions, yeah, this is the distribution. You can describe the central tendencies and variance. So the mean is, uh, is 1,988 and with a standard deviation of 26.7. Now, the coefficient of variation is simply the standard deviation divided by the mean. It's just the way to normalize the variance. So if you divide 26 by 2,000, you get something like uh, 0 0.013. Right? So that's just the measure of variability. Right? So higher numbers mean more variable. Now in contrast, when the bird is singing to a female, singing courtship song, his distribution tightens up. He's much more accurate. He's much more likely to hit that, the target fundamental frequency for that note. And therefore, you see the, the, the coefficient of variation is about half. Okay? So when these males are singing to females, their stereo their, the variability decreases, and ergo their, their acoustic stereotypy goes up. Okay, so this is one example of this. If you plot, um, this is data from a paper we published about 10 years ago. If you plot the coefficient of variation uh, for a syllable during non-courtship song on the x-axis, and that same uh, coefficient of variation for that same syllable when he's producing courtship song on the y-axis, you get a plot that looks like this. This dashed line is the line of unity. And what you see is that the vast majority of the points lie below the line of unity, indicating that the variability is lower when these males are singing courtship song. Okay. So lower CVs equals uh, higher stereotypy. OK, so what we want to do is we want to we want to first confirm in Daniel's study that we can actually with the birds that we're looking at that we actually see this change in these performance metrics tempo uh, stereotypy and duration, and what we're going to do is compute the percent change in these features going from non courtship song to courtship song. So non courtship song is the denominator. We see that the sequence duration is shorter when birds produce courtship song. And that's an indicative of them speeding up their songs. We see that the CV of the fundamental frequency is also lower when these birds are producing courtship song, indicating that they become more stereotyped. And song durations get longer when they're singing to females. Right? So all these things happen. The songs get faster, songs get more stereotyped, and songs become longer when these males are singing to females, which is, the, if you will, the main audience for these type of vocalizations. Questions? They're faster, and yeah. So, in terms of the the questions, what's the difference between a courtship song and a non-courtship song? So, the, in this example, we're producing them when male, the non-courtship songs are the ones that they produce when they're by themselves, and the courtship songs are not simply the songs they produce when they're with a the female, but they're actually direct, they're facing the female. They puff up and they dance a little bit at the same time. So, it seems like a more motivated song production. So it's not just the contrast between presence or absence of individual. Um, I'll show this in a, in a later experiment, but you can have uh, them housed next to an individual for the whole time and score some songs as not, court, not directed at the female and other songs that are directed at the female, and you still get the same kind of difference. Okay. Yes? 
All right, the question is, is there a season? So these guys are weird. So first of all, I'm embarrassed to say, but these guys aren't real birds. They're domesticated strains of the white back, white rump munia. Um, these guys breed a lot. Um, and they're probably seasons we haven't tracked it. They've been in the laboratory for so long when there's constant conditions. And it seems to vary, but I would say there's probably a little bit of a cycle, maybe an eight month cycle, but it's not like a really short like in wild uh, sparrows, for example, it's not a really, really short season. Yeah. I'm mostly wondering whether there would be any examples of a male crossing a female and not courting her. Mm. So what would that be called? So the question is, what would happen if a male saw a female and didn't court her? Like, it, it can happen. Um, it shouldn't happen, but it, it does happen. Okay, I'm going to move on for a little bit. Um, all right, so that's all. That's um, all sort of uh, a preamble to getting at the main question of uh, familiarity, right? So now I want, I've defined what I think these performance metrics of song are. The question is, does familiarity? So we saw previously that familiarity affected the motivation to sing. Now the question is, this, does familiarity affect the performance? These performance metrics of courtship song. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare the songs, the courtship songs that males produce on their first exposure to a female, so like the dark arrows here. Um, we're going to compare those songs to the songs that they produce on the second or third exposures to the female. These are the subsequent exposures to females. Nominally, in the first exposure, the female is unfamiliar. Right? And then thereafter, on the second and third exposure, the female is familiar. So we're, what we're doing here is contrasting songs produced to familiar females versus uh, songs produced to unfamiliar females. Okay. And what we're going to do is compute the percent change in these features from the first exposures when they're unfamiliar to uh, subsequent exposures so when they're familiar. So we're, we're really plotting out what the effect of familiarity is. So in general, you don't find dramatic changes to song performance metrics. You don't get a change in, in song tempo, the sequence duration. You don't get a change in acoustic stereotypy. But you do get a small change, but significant change in song duration. So most of the points are below, uh, below this line. This is 0%. And so what we generally find is that these courtship songs that, that males produce to females once they become familiar are shorter than the courtship songs that they produced to that same female when she was unfamiliar, i.e. Fir their first exposure to her. So there are some influences of familiarity on these performance metrics. Okay. And that's what I said here. Okay, so in summary, for this, this study seems uh, suggests that their familiarity decreases the motivation to produce a courtship song uh, and modulates some performance aspects of courtship song, but not a lot of them. Okay, so I want to quickly go through another study in zebra finches, um, and the short of it is that we basically find the same thing. So this study is motivated slightly differently. We're looking at the effects of, of whether or not male zebra finches produce courtship songs, different types of courtship songs, when they're presented with a live stimulus, so just another female in a different cage, versus a video presentation of a female. So that's the, that was the main motivation for the study, but this was designed in a way to complement the previous study in Bengalese finches to potentially look at the effects of familiarity on song production. So what we have are three blocks, and within each of these blocks we have video and live presentations of females. Uh, and within each of these video and live presentations, there are three consecutive exposures, either to the same female via video, these are three different video clips of, a, of the same female, or three different live exposures to a, a female. Right? So we have that same flavor of, of consecutively exposing males to the same female. And what you see, long story short, is what you see is that when you look at the probability of courtship, again, the likelihood that a male is going to produce courtship song on his first, second, or third exposure to a live female or a video ex uh, playback of a female, you have something that looks like this. That when you have these, this is LD is live directed songs, this is the probability of directed song to the live female. You see across these uh, exposures this gradual reduction in the likelihood of, of producing a uh, courtship song. It looks like that. And so that's consistent with what we've seen in, in Bengalese finches. But it's a little bit weird. When we looked at the video, we didn't see a lot of uh, dramatic changes in the probability of courtship across exposures. What we did see is quite salient from this is a, a difference in the propensity to display courtship song 
uh, between live and video presentations of the females. While they do produce these courtship songs to videos of females, they do this significantly less than these live presentations. Okay, um, so that's with regard to the motivation to sing. And with regard to performance metrics, when you look at total song duration, this, this is one of the performance metrics we talked about in the Bengalese finches, what you see is something, what you, see, uh, like what you observe, we observed in Bengalese finches, there is a decrease in song duration across consecutive exposures to the same female. Uh, when the first time they see these females, you get a really long song, and then thereafter, song durations go down and down with repeated exposures to that same female. Okay. And if you remember from the Bengalese finches, we found changes in song duration, but not other performance metrics, for example, song tempo. And here, you also don't get changes in song tempo. You get, it's, it's more or less a, a non-significant change over time. So the, the short of it is that in both Bengalese finches and zebra finches, we do find effects of familiarity on signaling, and we find primarily a very robust effect of familiarity on the motivation to produce courtship song. And then we find also that uh, some, but not all, of these performance metrics also change with familiarity. Any questions about these experiments? Okay, so moving on. So the second, uh, the, the uh, where'd they go? Oh, there, there. Is there any sense that um, the results could vary slightly here? Like, is that um, preferences of the male, or were the females all like the same? Yeah, so the, the, the question is, um, I think the ultimate question is, are there preferences to court particular females or not? And there are, there's certainly evidence in other species that there are preferences to court particular types of females, particular morphs of, within a species, for example, and Gouldian finches have this. We have not systematic, we anecdotally think there might be that, but we haven't systematically documented that in, in our colony of zebra finches and, and Bengalese finches. That being said, we, we do vary the females quite a bit, especially with the, the Bengalese finches, we use at least six different females. Um, so it is possible, but I think that would, that would affect the, it wouldn't really affect the interpretation of the repeated exposures to the same female. Right? I, I don't think it would, not, not dramatically. I think even if you'd preferred or non-preferred females, you would get a decrement. Maybe it might change, the slope might change. If you have a really, really sexy female for that bird, he might produce courtship song on, on maybe like 100% the first time, maybe 80% on the third time, whereas a less preferred female, maybe there's a f more rapid change in, in motivation to court, maybe the first time it's 50% and by the third time it's 0% or something like that. Right? So there is that possibility, but we haven't looked at that interaction between preference and the rate of habituation. Yes? Uh, it's four to five minutes. Four, no, sorry, four to five, sorry. Four to five, four to five, so five minutes. Yeah. So that's a rather short period. Of yeah. Of course, you're more yes. Waiting. Yeah. So what if you did this on a day, every day? Yeah. Right. So we haven't done that. What we have done is we've done these. So in this experiment, you have, they, they're exposed to that female three times, and you wait two days, and you see whether or not, even when you expose this male to that same female, if he courts her. And it looks like it's somewhere, it's, it's not at 100%, but it's somewhere in the middle. There's a little bit of dishabituation, but it's not nearly, it's not as if, he, it, the data, if you want to overinterpret the data, the data look like he hasn't totally forgotten her, but he's forgotten her a little bit. Right? Uh, I can show you that at the end, I have it, but, but there's, we do have some evidence of long-term memory, it's just not as robust as what you see in the short term. Long term being two days, right? Yes. Did you have a question? No. Okay. All right, moving on. So the last experiment I want to talk about is, is looking at the effects of audience composition on song performance. Now, before I go on, uh, this, this study was motivated by, oh, this, is, this analysis at least, was motivated by a number of experiments in, in looking at speech and language in humans, thinking about the change in vocalizations when adults speak to infants versus other adults. Um, but one of the things that, we, that wasn't known for a long time is, was the specificity of these vocal modulations. Right? So we're, we're primarily contrasting uh, speech to adults to spe versus speech to infants, and we're interpreting these changes as maybe 
useful for helping in infants acquire language. Um, but I think before we do that, uh, we need to look at the specificity of these changes. Now, there's a, a series of interesting studies out of Dennis Burnham's lab um, where they've looked at how the nature of, of speech changes when adults are speaking to different types of audiences. Okay. So this is the traditional comparison, adult-directed speech versus infant-directed speech. But there are other organisms that we think are really cute and we speak differently to, and those are pets. Right? And so what Dennis did was he compared the acoustic properties of adult-directed speech, infant-directed speech, and pet-directed pet speech from these same individuals. Okay. And they focus, I'm going to focus on two of the parameters, uh, namely the pitch of vocalizations, as well as this, what we call the, the hyperarticulation of vowel space. Okay, so with regard to pitch, this is the comparison. We see what we always see, that when people are speaking to infants, their pitch is higher than what you see when they're speaking to adults. And when you speak to pets, you do the same thing, you being they. Uh, they people speak to pets with, in a higher registry, and they speak to the pets in the pitch that's kind of like the pitch that you use when you speak to infants. So that's interesting. Um, but what's different is this hyperarticulation. So here, when you look at this triangle, this is again looking at these vowel spaces, e, u, and a, uh, sheep, shoe, and shark. Uh, and what you see is for adult direct directed speech in yellow, this is a triangle here. For infant directed speech in red, is a much larger triangle, so you see that hyperarticulation. But when you speak to pets, despite that your pitch is higher, you don't change the uh, vocal space, the articulatory space. You only see that hyperarticulation when uh, people are speaking to infants, at least only in, in this case. And so this supported this idea that this hyperarticulation, this expansion of vowel space, might be important for the acquisition of speech and language. Now, there are a couple of variants to this. Um, so, well, a, a pet is not a pet is not a pet, so there are different types of pets, and you can have pets that, like, when you speak to a dog, you're not expecting that dog to say something back to you, right? But if you have a parrot, maybe you're expecting that pet, parrot to say something back to you. So maybe when you speak to parrots, you're gonna show if this hyperarticulation is important for somehow language or speech acquisition, maybe when you speak to parrots, you'll show this hyperarticulation, but you don't. People don't do that when they speak to parrots. They only show this hyperarticulation, despite that you could ascribe parrots with some sort of uh, communicative ability that, that can mimic some parts of human speech and language, when we speak to parrots, we, we kind of uh, speak to parrots like we speak to dogs with regard to this uh, hyperarticulation. Uh, and lastly, what you do, another way to think about this is, is just differences in the ability of other adults to speak your own language. So what uh, another study out of, again, Dennis Burnham's group is to look at the articulatory features in, uh, in these individuals when they speak to, uh, to infants, uh, when they speak to adults, that speak their own, native, their own language, or when they're speaking to adults who speak a foreign language, in this case, they're English-speaking individuals. So these are adults that, are learning a, uh, that speak a foreign language but are learning how to speak English as a second language. Okay. And this group being a group of individuals who are maybe learning, trying to acquire that language, in this case, English. And what you see with pitch, you see pitch is elevated only when people speak to infants, and these, the FDS is foreign directed, foreigner directed speech, and this is adult directed speech. You don't see an increase in pitch uh, when you're talking to adults, only when you see it when, with cute little infants. Um, but you see hyperarticulation, this expansion of vowel space, when individuals are speaking to individuals who don't speak the native language. So all of this to say, there's a couple th points for bringing all this up. First is that there are different dimensions of speech that can change with different audiences and that these, these dimensions are, seem to be independently controlled. Okay, so we ran this study, again, part of, a large part of my lab looks at uh, song learning in songbirds as, uh, as, if we will, a model for thinking about speech acquisition in humans. Uh, and one of the things we looked at was the effects of social interactions on vocal learning. Okay. And our paradigm was, it looked something like this, where we had these two sound attenuating chambers uh, we had this uh, naive juvenile, uh, ju juvenile that hadn't heard uh, zebrafinch song before. Um, it was housed next to an adult here. This would be called our social pupil. And this bird could visually and acoustically interact with the tutor. 
and this tutor, this adult male, could quote unquote tutor this other bird. Uh, what we had was a microphone above the tutor's cage here, and that piped sounds down into a second uh, chamber here, uh, which housed a, a, another juvenile that just passively heard the songs that this tutor produced. Right? So produced, you know, it heard all the sounds that these, these guys produced, but it, it wasn't able to interact with the tutor. So that was the design that we used, and in doing this, and in watching the videos of these interactions, we noticed that these tutors did direct songs at these juveniles. So it looks something like this. Here's the adult male zebra finch on the left, and the pupil, or the juvenile on the right. So these adult males, I'll turn this down, give the buzzing noise. All right, so they'll produce these songs and we think they're directing them at the juveniles. And the function of this directed song is unclear, but we can look at the, the features of juvenile directed song and contrast those to songs that are not, produ that are not directed toward the juvenile. All right, so this is how we analyze song. This is a spectrogram, again, frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And we're gonna I'm gonna talk to you about three features of the zebra finch song. Now, the zebra finch song is really simple. It's, it's, a, it's a stereotype sequence of what we call syllables, or these sound elements, where we label them with letters, these arbitrary letters for analysis. So this bird produces an A, then a B, then a C, I can't see the alignment, uh, then a D, then an E. And it produces the A, B, C, D, E sequence. That's his motif. He produces an ad nauseum, um, and that's his one phrase that he sings for, the whole, for his whole life. Okay. And this whole, what we call this, this sort of uh, stringing together of motifs, a song bout. And in this song bout, the motifs are separated by some interval, this gap, and we call this the inner motif interval. And this song bout is preceded by a repetition of these simple notes called introductory notes. Right? So there's this repetition here, followed by a motif, followed by an interval, followed by another motif. And what we're gonna do is compare these aspects of song uh, when individuals direct songs at juveniles, what we call juvenile directed song, to songs not directed at juveniles or undirected songs. And we're gonna plot the percent change in these features. And what you see is that when individuals are directing songs at individuals, they repeat these introductory notes more often, so there's more repetition in their song. The intervals between these motifs, motifs increases. They have larger gaps between these motifs. Um, and so these are reminiscent of the types of changes you see during infant-directed speech. You see more repetition as well as um, longer gaps between vocalizations. Uh, but you get no change to the variability of vocalizations. Right? Birds are quite, uh, when they're singing to juveniles versus when they're singing not to juveniles, they have the same degree of, of stereotypy. So that's that. And given this all that I've been saying about hyperarticulation, we thought maybe it's possible that there's some hyperarticulation in birds. And so we mapped out these songs in multidimensional space. This is the principal, the principal components analysis of these features, acoustic features of the song. And the short of it is that we didn't see any change. I think it'd be really cool if you could see some greater differentiation between syllables when they're directing their songs to juveniles, but we didn't find any evidence of that. So birds are not people. Okay, so we have this juvenile directed song, and well, now we're talking about, since we're talking about audience effects, and the other audience that we've been studying extensively in the lab is our adult females. So we wanna ask, in these same males, how do these songs, how do they change their songs when they're singing to females? And here in this study, what we've done was we've housed these males with, next to juveniles for about five days. And so we did, we did the same thing for females. We just housed these males next to females for five days and compared their directed versus undirected songs. And you see when they, in this uh, sort of experimental paradigm, this is different from the other ones that we've done, but now they're housed directly next to a female. When they're directing songs at the female, you see a slight increase in the introductory notes. But what's interesting is that you don't get a change in the motif interval. In fact, if anything, they get shorter the gaps between these motifs get shorter when they're singing to a female versus when they're singing not to the female. And if you look at the CV of fundamental frequency, this is consistent with the previous studies. What you find is that 
when they're singing to females, they decrease the variability of their song. Right? But they don't do that when they're singing to juveniles. Right? And when they're singing to juveniles, they increase the motif intervals, but they don't do that when they're singing to females. Right? So there's the specificity of this modulation depending on the audience. Right? And so what that means, or what the function of that is, is we're not, still, we're not clear, but one possibility is that maybe this increasing the gap between these intervals might serve to help, might potentiate or help learning of these songs in juveniles. But, you know, we still have to test that hypothesis. Okay, uh, I have a little bit of time. Yes? Uh, so the question is, did I look at the quality of the songs being tu tutored? Well, I'll give you the back. Yes. So, so that was the main goal of the study, is to look at the effects of social interactions on vocal learning. These guys uh, produced more accurate imitations of the adult tutor song than the passively tutored pupils. And the idea was to have the criticism for Marler and, the, and even Petr the Baptista work was when they compared the social versus the non-socially tutored birds, they didn't just differ in the level of interaction, but they differed in the amount of song exposure, right? So here they're yoked, and then so they get the same exposure. Okay, okay. Um, but I thought you were gonna ask, is there a correlation between the degree of modulation, uh, how the adults change their song to tutors and how much the tutors learned? And no. Right. So that, we would have loved to have seen that, but we didn't see that adult uh, tutors that modulated their songs more in this way produce greater learning outcomes in their office, in, their, in the pupils. Yep, Clint. So the function of the introductory notes yeah. is to tell the receiver something important is coming. So the, Clint asks, is there, what's the function of the introductory notes? Some people think that the introductory notes are for motor preparation to prepare the system for the song. Um, the other possibility, this is an old uh, uh, speculation, is that these introductory notes are species typical. So it's to maybe communicate what species of song is coming up next and then to pay attention or not. But it, it could serve as some attention grabbing uh, vocalizations as well. But they're really slow in, ampli lo really low in amplitude. Any more questions? Okay, so in the remaining time, I, I want to be, this is just a summary of blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the remaining time, I want to think a little bit about interpretations, like how, how do we interpret these changes in behavior across these different audiences? Okay. Now, I started this lecture talking about the potential implications of audience effects and this possibility that audience effects could suggest some volitional control over signal production or it could even, if you go a little bit step further, it could suggest that signalers are aware of the receiver's perceptual states and are uh, able to adjust their signals accordingly, right? So those are distinct possibilities. I think that's a, you have to do a lot of different experiments to get to those, uh, to make those conclusions. And even in the end, uh, it's, it's hard really to draw those conclusions, uh, I think, in general. And so what I wanted to stress here is uh, to think about multiple interpretations of the kind of data that we could collect. And you know, one possibility is that, and this is something that people always talk about when they think about audience effects, is that it's possible that these changes in behavior uh, when signalers are in different, uh, are surrounded by different audiences, is simply a manifestation of changes in physiological state. Right? So let's, for example, let's contrast when, when birds are housed with juveniles, versus juvenile males versus adult females. You could see those as being very, very different uh, for this focal male here and leading to very, very different physiological states. And maybe that's the root of this difference in the directed songs. Now that explanation is, is a different level of analysis where you, it's, it's not really speaking to whether or not there are cognitive aspects to this, but it's certainly things, uh, when I think about mechanisms, I think that this could be a potential mechanism underlying variation in signal performance. Uh, and the other thing I think is important to think about is to what degree audience effects on signals could reflect variation in the behavior of receivers is a question that was asked about the female behavior, uh, right? So 
it's possible that these changes in, in signal production are simply manifestations of more complex stimulus response uh, effect. And I think we can all appreciate the complexity of analyzing behavior and the need to think about these, these alternative explanations. And just to bring this back to this hyperarticulation, one thing that's really, I think there's a really neat study done in humans looking at feedback from infants. And so we talked about this hyperarticulation, this expansion of vocal space when, when mothers or parents talk to their infants. But it turns out that infant behavior seems to play quite a big role in that expansion. So what they did, this is a study by Lam and Kitamura and in 2012, and what they did was they had mothers interact with their, their infants via video. And unbeknownst to the mother, they manipulated the degree to which that infant could hear the mother's voice. In some cases, the, the baby could hear the mother's vocalizations. In other cases, they lowered the volume of the mother's vocalizations. And in the last case, they just, the, they couldn't, the babies couldn't hear the mother at all. But in all these instances, the mother didn't know what the, whether the baby could hear or not. They, was, they were just told that the baby could hear them. And what it turns out is that when, in all these cases, the, fem the mothers spoke with higher pitch when they're speaking to their infants, but they only showed this hyperarticulation when the infants could hear them. Right? Now, when, when the infants could not hear them, in this, very, this is the inaudible case, there is, no hyper, there is no hyperarticulation of these vowels. Now, I should stress that the mothers don't know that the babies can't hear them, right? But there are variations in the baby's behaviors that are not, especially this idea of contingency, right? If the mother says something, the baby will respond. You get this sort of reciprocal interactions. And that seems to be something that could help drive this, this hyperarticulation. But the, the point here is that the mothers didn't know anything about the, the, the baby's uh, audible, audible ability state. Probably could monitor the changes in behavior, but there was a clear effect on the mother's vocalization. And even the, this is other um, condition in their group where they actually manipulated what the mothers thought. In some cases, they said, okay, your, your baby can hear you. And in other cases, they said, your baby cannot hear you. But that in and of itself didn't change their, hyper their degree of hyperarticulation. It's just the infant's behavior that changed the mother's behavior. Okay. So, so with that in mind, we, we thought a little bit about, you know, Clearly, juvenile males and adult females are very different audiences, and maybe they behave differently to these uh, directed songs at them. And what it turns out, if you, we have measured what we think could be manifestations of attention, so when birds hear songs, at least juveniles and other males, when they hear songs, they freeze, and they stop engaging in other behaviors. And so what we did was we scored all these videos of males singing to juveniles or singing to females. And what we found is that when males were singing to juveniles, juveniles were significantly more likely to freeze than females were. And so here's the, the, the plot. On about 70% of the songs that were directed to juveniles, the juveniles were considered, were scored as attentive. In contrast, when uh, in only 50% of the occasions when the adult female was, um, uh, was when the male produced a directed song at the adult female, was the adult female considered to be attentive? So it could be this sort of reciprocal interaction between the receiver's behavior and the signaler's behavior that caused this change in song production or song performance. Right, so in the end, I, I think it's, I, I like thinking about audience effects, how social interactions can modulate vocalizations. And I, I like thinking about the extent to which they could lend insight into the nervous system processes or as well as potentially social cognition. But I think we just have to be careful and we have to do the right controls. Okay. So before I go, uh, finish, I'd like to thank my students. There's uh, Nancy Chen and Laura Matheson are the two students who, graduate students who did the work on the social tutoring of juveniles and looking at adult uh, female directed song versus juvenile directed song. Danielle and Harry did the work on habituation or familiarity in Bengalese finches. And Reina and Logan did the work on video analyses in, in zebra finches. And I'd like to thank my funding agencies and you for all your attention. So we have 20 minutes on the docket for questions and discussion. So one way to think about um, uh, the interaction of babies and infants sort of tracking information is that they're statistical learners and they're yep. trying to 
And from that perspective, you might imagine that they're um, potentially exploiting the sensory biases of the signal. Yep. And in thinking about some of the things that you're saying about like, the pet-directed speech, and also here uh, closer at the end when you were talking about the um, inability of mothers to know that their babies are responding, it makes me wonder to what extent you're getting those sensory biases where pets, some fuzzy pets, like non-parrots, uh, maybe more baby-like, and then you sort of do give them more baby-like speech, yeah. whereas the parrots, you know, maybe you put big eyes on them, yeah. you would get that. Yeah. On the other hand, um, when babies aren't responding, they're not giving those cooties or whatever it is, those signals. Yeah. So I'm wondering to what extent, and that's one of, I think, your alternative yep. explanations. I'm yep. wondering to what extent that um, one other evidence Yeah. I mean, I don't, so it's speculation. One of the things I should point out, so I do think that the receiver behavior can feed back. I think there's, that's unquestionable. Um, the, I think the, the strong test of this prediction, this, uh, the possibility that maybe that males are producing different songs to adult females versus juvenile males is because of the receiver behavior. You can actually, within um, the context in which they're just singing to juveniles, there are some instances in which they're, the juveniles are attentive versus when they're not attentive. And if you look at those two, there's actually not a dramatic difference in the structure between those kind of, when the, receive, when the juvenile is inattentive versus when he's rescored as attentive. So I'm not sure that that has, that underlies that can explain all the variation between these two conditions. Um, that being said, so let's say you put some fur on a parrot, and then you give it bigger eyes, and you had it roll around and like wag, put it, it can wag its parrot tail or something like that. Whatever it makes a, a pet more canine-like, um, that is possible that it would maybe do something, make it seem more dog-like. That being said, I'm trying to think, the parrots and the dogs had pretty similar types of directed speech, speech directed toward them, right? So, I mean, it can't be all this because an infant is not like an adult, foreign, uh, adult who's speaking English, as, who's learning English, English as a second language, right? So it can't just be that. There's probably, in humans, there's some, probably some cognitive process that underlies that modulation in vocalizations. Um, but I think that you can... Uh, I don't know how much evidence there is. Uh, there's probably a bunch of evidence suggesting that receiver behavior can change it, but the specifics of it, I, I can't really trust. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. That's part for the course. Yep. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the other alternative explanation in terms of uh, states of arousal? Sure. Uh, I, I, you mentioned, uh, this was my immediate response, that, well, it's a bit of a lateral explanation. Yep. And, um, seems like you could probably catch out a lot of co genuinely cognitive differences uh, in terms of other words by feeling a different level of explanation, right? Uh, yeah, so, sorry, can you... So, if, this, if, what you're, if that alternative explanation is, for example, that um, uh, the state of arousal explains um, explains the difference. Yep. Um, it might be that that particular state of arousal is typed to a particular perceptual. Sure. Yep. In which case, um, it really is just a matter of whether you're talking about states of arousal or cognitive states. I mean, I guess part of it is like, well, if you have things like individual recognition affecting arousal, right? So let's say I recognize this individual, I saw this individual again and over and over ad nauseum, this person is now boring to me, I see a new person. Um, now is it the actual the cognitive process itself or is that change in arousal behavior, the arousal in the nervous system that causes a change in behavior or is it one and the same thing, right? Is that the mechanism by which individual recognition leads to a change in behavior albeit through through arousal, right? So I think it's a little bit different. It's, it's providing a mechanism by which these cognitive processes could change uh, behavior, but I don't think they can be used necessarily against the argument that there could be cognitive processes underlying them. <laughs> okay, so I just misunderstood you. I thought that you were saying that was an alternative. It it, I go back and forth, maybe, and maybe that's probably why I didn't. I mean, that's, I think this is something to consider, right, to think about. And this is certainly something that people talk about when you think about the literature on audience effects. You could say, well, we, we do have to control, think about things like arousal and stress to explain this variation, right? Yep. Is there a huge variation between uh, uh, raised and... Uh, Lab raised? Is there a difference between uh, uh, sound production and uh, raised activity? 
Uh, so the question is, is there a, uh, a difference in song production in individuals raised in the laboratory versus in the wild, right? And so which aspect of song are you referring to? Like, are you talking about the acoustic structure of song or how much song they produce? Or all of it? Yeah, so um, the, in the laboratory, they seem to display the same types of behaviors that they display in the wild. They're, they're very gregarious. At least, let's say, I'll just talk about zebra finches for now. They're very gregarious. They are monogamous. They, they produce species-typical songs that, that females like. We can, they display these uh, learning biases that uh, are, are, are reminiscent of these biases that we see in wild populations. So I, I think they're, they're, they can provide insight into the function of wild uh, populations of birds. Yeah. Yes? What about the, yeah, 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 right, so they're individually housed throughout development because of the, the question was on social learning, or the vocal learning, and there's a lot of different social influences there, um, but when you look at these birds when they're adults, they, they perform the same range of social behaviors at the same intensity. So if you take these birds that were raised individually throughout development for these experiments, you present them with a female, they'll court those females, and they'll actually show the same degree of vocal modulations as you do as an as a individual raised in a colony situation. Right? So they will display the same range of behaviors as, as colony-raised individuals, but they're housed individually throughout development for these experimental purposes of looking at the effects of social interactions on, on vocal learning. Is that, yes? Yep, you. Uh, so in humans, we found that, or researchers have found that uh, the presence of an audience can be either better or worse in uh, their performance based on their level of expertise. So if you practice in front of this a lot, the audience actually makes you better yeah, I see. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. So the question is, to what degree does expertise interact with, with audience effects? And when you look at juveniles, they've actually done this experiment. So when juveniles are developing their songs, um, they, they produce a lot of songs and in a lot of instances, they don't, you know, the, the, the gold standard for song learning is how well that the song of the tutored individual resembles the song of the tutor. Okay. And at 90 days of age, or maybe at 60 to 90 days of age, they don't resemble the tutor all that much. But when you put a female in there, they, they produce a song that looks just like the tutor. So there's something really weird about the bird's undirected songs when they're, that they're, they produce when they're by themselves, um, but they'll clean it up when they sing to females. So it's a little bit different. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition. They're not quite experts at producing their vocalizations, but when there's an audience or they're directing it, they actually, it's actually much, much better. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so let me just clarify, in the chickens, it's only when females are around that they produce the food calls, and so when other males are around, they don't put the food calls in, in part. Sorry? Yeah. Will they call, oh, so I don't know, so it, basically you're competing the, this idea that food calls if, with another male around would lead to more competition, but there's a female there. I don't know if, what would they would do in those situations. It's a good question. I, I don't know what chickens would do. This is mostly a comment um, based on my understanding with, of what you um, described when talking about the, the, the ways we, we speak with infants, talk to infants, yep. the way, ways we talk to other adults. Um, it's as if we're, maybe it's just my imagination, but it's as if we're presenting this like those are 
innate ways of doing things, like DNA, coded in our DNAs, and it's not necessarily that, right? For example, elder speech, that's a new thing. Um, we speak with, the, the, the younger people tend to speak with elders, a little bit like we speak with babies nowadays, and it, this is new. So I'm wondering if the way we speak with babies is hard-coded, or if it's also learned. And so, right. you know, looking for correlations between our ways of speaking with babies and what the birds are doing, um, how is that? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, first of all, I don't, I don't know to what degree this infant direct speech is learned or, or innate, right? So the, the, the best evidence you can garner in humans is whether, as how universal it is. And it's quite universal in terms of the way that we do it. But at the same time, if you're raised, maybe part of it is like you remember when you're growing up, this is pretty hard, but remember when you're growing up, you had this, your mother spoke to you in different ways. Um, so it's unclear. I don't know to what degree it is innate or not. Right? We can't do the experiments, right? Um, so the second question as to whether or not the birds provide a strong a parallel to that is, is open for debate, right? So I think there are some extensions, and, and maybe this is all just, hap you know, just a coincidence that this happens, right? But I guess the specificity of the changes in terms of the, the timing changes uh, suggests that it's possible that it's, it's important for helping learning, and that's, but at the same time, we still have to test that. Right? I mean, that's, it's up to us. If, that, if we're arguing that that's important for vocal learning in infants, we, should do the, we need to do the experiments where we increase the intervals for that. Um, but I think you know, there are, as far as animals go, that, uh, that mimic the sort of vocal learning capacities or vocal learning trajectories in humans, Songbirds are one of the best. They, they, they follow a lot of the things. They, there's a sensory period where they have to learn the vocalizations, then they go through a babbling phase where they're you know, trying to practice how to produce that vocalization. So I think there's a lot of behavioral parallels between them, but maybe we're taking it too far, right, in this case. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, sort of two semi-related questions. Have you manipulated adult or juvenile body condition in the lab? to examine its effect on, say, CV of the F. Right. Uh, the question was whether or not we've manipulated body condition and looked at performance metrics of song. So we have not. There have been people who looked at sort of the developmental stress hypothesis to think about how is it that the developmental environment, like if you are have a lot of siblings, so maybe you have less food to, um, to yourself, and does that affect your performance? And the... The short of it is it doesn't seem to affect the performance all that much. I don't know about short-term effects, though. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it is possible that if there are changes in body state, that they could affect the degree to which they're, the stereotypy of their song or their tempo of song. I think some things might be more sensitive to those changes in body condition and yeah. versus others, yeah. So like in, in Orthoptera, that yep. same body condition, the, the quality of their songs tied to... Okay more fat, yeah. they can sing at a higher frequency. And, and what, sorry, what is the metric for song quality in the top turns? Um, the number of pulses yeah. and the number of chirps. Okay. So, the so rate. And the um, okay. duration of the, okay. the song. So you can sing longer when you have more yeah. fat stores. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, my second question was, um, is, is there any um, aspect of personality going on here? Do certain individuals, or do individuals, sing more similarly under certain circumstances than other individuals? I don't know about that. The question was, to what degree does personality manifest itself in song performance? Um, I don't know. We haven't done a lot of studies of personality. I guess the way... And part of my is just my ignorance of what personality is. I mean, if it's just a, a correlated, stable suite of behavioral traits, well, that's more then of a behavioral syndrome. Okay. A personality would be like um, I sing um, similarly in different contexts. Yeah. Um, so, like the non-courtship. Yeah. So do. So, like, if they so don't modulate them, yeah. Has is up at the top end of yeah. the non-courtship and the courtship yeah. all the time. He's yeah. always up here, and another male is always down. Okay. Is that, or does the... Uh, so there is variation in how much that they will change the performance of their song from, from non-courtship to courtship song. And the degree to which that's stable is unclear, but I think 
when we look at individuals, we do find quite a bit of like, let's say you do this look at courtship song and non courtship song across several weeks, there's going to be the same, generally the same degree of modulation for that individual. Um, and as to whether and how much individual variation is, can be uh, predicted by previous experiences, unclear. But, but one thing to note is that uh, in response to a previous question, if you look at birds, the developmental experiences of those birds, at least as far as we can tell, doesn't affect the degree to which they, they change this, the performance. They always sing faster and more stereotype songs when they're singing to females, regardless of their developmental experiences. Last one. Four minutes. Go ahead. I was going to follow up on your question. So I don't know the details very well, but Vicky Shrews has shown some degree of personality characteristics in song production in zebra finches. And that was a while ago, so I've forgotten some of those details. Who was that? Vicky Shrews. Okay. Um, that's C H T E, I think. Um, and then more recently, the Goldstein group, um, uh, Mike Goldstein and one of his students, Katarina Faust, has been looking into personality of uh, also zebra finches in terms of uh, male performance and female pairing, because as a strong thing, they form these pair bonds. Right. And in fact, you get self-assortative sort of personality characteristics between sort of what females prefer and what males uh, do. So there is some of that going on there. It's yeah. just beginning to be looked at. It. Yeah. Well, it was, and then it's beginning to be looked at again in the, in the context that John's been talking about now. Yeah. So maybe it's not. Okay. Yes. A more ecosystemic point of view um, are different the audience effects affected among different species. Do you see the same degree of audience effects across species, or are you asking for species variation, or in wild populations versus lab populations? Uh, I mean, different species living together. Okay. Or oh, in mixed species, okay. Is the audience effects? Uh, effective among them. Oh, so are you asking the specificity of audience effects to conspecifics versus heterospecifics in a mixed species yeah. environment? So I, I suspect there's audience effects, in those, especially in those environments, they're going to be both species will come into play, right? Because especially in mixed species groups, like you do have this eavesdropping, I, I, I think uh, Gordon was saying something about eavesdropping, uh, heterospecific eavesdropping uh, from reptiles and, and bird alarm calls. And I think there is that interplay between heterospecifics, especially in those environments where they're mixed species. So I, I suspect there are going to be pretty salient uh, audience effects in, based on heterospecifics as well. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say that both heterospecific and conspecific audiences can affect focal effect signaling. That's, I guess, without, I'm not sure about agency, so I would just go as far as the extent that both species can affect behavior, especially in these mixed species flocks. You know? So that's what I, I that's how I would interpret the data if something came up like that. <laughs> I'm sorry I was late arriving. My, my question may be um, inappropriate, but um, why wouldn't you expect this drop in motivation over, over time and over instant where you get um, either a degradation or habituation? Sure. No, that, this is a classic habituation disabituation design. So, why? why what, what conclusion can you draw from it if not that it's, it, it's predictable? And well, I guess one of the conclusions was in a lot of these studies of audience effects, they've mostly just looked at the, the motivation to produce particular uh, vocalization. So in the case, the likelihood of producing a song. But there hasn't been investigation about the, the quality or the performance metrics of the songs themselves. So we looked at both changes in motivation to sing as well as the performance metrics. So this is not surprising at all. I, I'm not declaring that this is anything shocking. This is a pretty standard uh, uh, evidence for individual recognition. But the fact that some aspects of, of vocal performance itself, not just the likelihood of signaling, but the, the actual song that was produced itself could also change with familiarity is a little bit different. It's, I think, how, what we've added to this. But like you said, this is just 
habituation, dishabituation. Right? Just to get to a lot, did, did, did in any of these instances the courtship scene lead to mating? No, so this is one of the questions about frustration. So these, these birds are in separate cages. So it's possible that it's just learning that if I court, nothing happens, so why court, right? Yeah, so there are multiple interpretations for this, but the, I think it's consistent with this idea of individual recognition. Right? If, it's just, if it's just learning that I will not copulate after this, it would just be flat, despite that if you change the female, you shouldn't see a dishabituation, right? Right, yeah. Okay, I think that's it for your 90 minutes slot. Okay. Okay, Thank please you. join me in thanking John for his presentation.